then I will get started immediately. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello and welcome to this last session of uh, the day. I'm super happy to be, 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 be with you today. My name is Rainer Stropik and I'm broadcasting here. I join you remotely from beautiful Austria. I'm sitting here in my hometown Linz, which is right in the middle between Salzburg and Vienna and the weather is Awesome. I, I We have blue skies, the, the sun is shining, the best evening to write some rust code if you ask me. So I hope you, the weather and, and the, the mood is similarly good in London and I'm looking forward to having 45 minutes about how to implement APIs with rust. Now, you see, I'm a passionate Rust developer. I discovered Rust some years ago and I fell in love with this language. I think it's super useful, it's super powerful. I love to work with it, I love to do trainings with it, I love to build solutions with it. But unfortunately, the, the community of Rust isn't as large as I would love it to be. And therefore, I thought that I, um, I suggest this session. So maybe I can find some additional restations at the end of, of the session. So my goal, as announced in the abstract, is to show you how to build a web API with Rust. Don't worry if you are not a Rust professional. That's absolutely no problem. Um, I announced this session to be useful for you, independent of whether you have done some Rust before. It is important that you have some programming background. So I hope you know your way around a typical programming constructs. And if you know that, we are perfectly fine. Okay, let's talk about what we are going to do today. If you compare Rust with other platforms, like for instance, JavaScript or Go, or maybe C Sharp and .NET and so on. All these platforms have um, a, a rather a, a typical approach for building an API. I mean, take a look at .NET. I don't know if any .NET developers are in the room, but if, I can tell you I'm a .NET developer too. If I build an API with .NET, I take the framework ASP.NET Core and that's it. If you are a Go developer, you probably, or in many cases, just use what's in the box, what's in the standard library, and you only take a few small libraries and your API is, is done. Maybe you take a framework, but a lot of people do it without any framework. You have a kind of obvious choice or a very limited number of obvious choices. Same is true for JavaScript. You can build it from scratch or you use something like Express. Many people use Express. There, You have a limited number of choices. In Rust, the standard library doesn't contain a lot of stuff. The Rust standard library is a tiny one, a tiny one which really focuses on the core abstractions that you need in order to build software. Why is that so? Well, Rust is a very versatile platform. With Rust, you can do systems programming. You can do systems programming on any platform. You even can do IoT projects. You can do projects where you're working directly on top of a microprocessor and you don't even have an operating system below you. So Rust is a, a, Rust is a language with which, with which you can go very, very deep. You can build very efficient software, very fast software, and Rust is known to be very secure. However, if you uh, focus on building applications, and this is what we are going to do today, you build on top of the standard library and then you have to make some choices. You have to choose, um, even if you want to do async programming, you immediately need a library because the standard library in Rust only contains fundamental abstractions but you immediately need some kind of async runtime. So this is typical for Rust. Rust is very versatile and very flexible. On the other hand side, the drawback of that is that you have to bring your own uh, libraries and frameworks for a, lot of, uh, for a lot of questions. And today I announced or I, I, I wrote in the title and in the abstract that we are going to be in the, in the technology stack of Tokyo. Rust has a very widely used technology stack, which is called Tokyo, as you can see it here. IO, this IO at the end, uh, stands for input output. And essentially what Tokyo is, Tokyo is a stack, a technology stack. 
It starts at the very, very bottom. You see it down here with bytes and tracing and Neo and so on. And further on top, you have things like a middleware system, which can be used on the, for instance, HTTP client side and at the HTTP server side. You have an HTTP server implementation. You have a lot of building blocks that you need in order to build typical network applications. This is what Tokyo is all about. And today we are going to stay in this Tokyo stack. So um, what we do is we build an API with Rust on the one hand side, but also with the Tokyo stack. Now all these components, I don't have the time to go into all the details here, but all these components are rather low level rather low level. If you want to build a web API, you typically build on top of a more abstract application layer. And there we add a tool which is called Axum. Axum is the framework that we are going to use. Axum is a modular web framework that you see here, but it is built by the Tokyo team and it builds on top of Tokyo, Tower and Hyper. The web server the middleware system and the whole async runtime. So this is what we are going to do. Tokyo has become um, an Exum has become pretty, pretty widespread. So let's take a quick look at crates.io. If you're not familiar with, with Rust, crates is what you might know from JavaScript, from NPM packages or from, from C sharp would be a NuGet package or in Java that would be Maven. And in Rust, this is crates, crates.io. And if we take a look at Axum, here it is. We are currently on version uh, 0, 0 0.6. And if you scroll down a little bit, and if you take a look at the um, at the stats, you see that we have nearly 12 million downloads. And uh, this thing is really heavily used. And you see version six is getting more and more traction. So this is a framework that is not an edge case that only a few people use. This is something that is widely used in the area of, of Rust. Still, you have a lot of choices but if you ask me, the Tokyo stack becomes a kind of a standard in Rust. So if you build some IO oriented applications like web servers, web APIs and things like that, a lot of people bet the farm on the Tokyo stack. And this is why I decided that today we are going to program a little bit with Tokyo. Good. That's it. Now you know what we are going to do. And with that, we are going to jump right into the code. You see, I prepared a very tiny, teeny little starter project here. It essentially contains a little bit of business logic. You see it here in the to do logic project. This is a typical Rust project. Our to do logic already in indicates what we are going to build today. We are going to build a to do list API, that traditional hello world sample, right? Don't worry, at the end of the talk, if we still have time, I can show you a more elaborate sample that I already also brought with me, where you will see things like database access and more elaborate error handling and so on. But this is a more a fundamental talk. I would like to, to really convince you that Rust is a great platform that you should consider when building APIs. So this to-do logic is pre-built. We are not going to cover it in great details. I can open it up for you so you get an idea and you get a feeling for how this looks, how this, how this Rust code looks like if you are new to Rust. See, uh, this is the typical way of structuring uh, data transfer objects in Rust. If you are new to that, you see Rust has structs. Yes, very similar to other programming languages, but Rust only has structs. So don't expect classes and things like that. Rust just has structs. That's it. It's very, very simple. The second thing that you can take away from this small little code sample is this one. This hash means that we see here a macro. Okay, this is a macro. Um, Rust does a lot with macros. Why does Rust a lot with macros? Well, Rust doesn't have runtime um, reflection. That simply doesn't exist. So if you come from a managed language like, like I don't know, uh, C Sharp or Java or something like this, you have reflection. You have reflection, you can at, at runtime, you can ask, okay, which classes do I have? Which methods do I have? Which properties do I have? And you can 
uh, you can build or interpret logic at runtime. You can build a router that uses reflection to find out how the different things are working and you can build your routes uh, accordingly. You can build a JSON serialization, serializer by taking a look at the structure of your classes and objects and build the necessary serialization and deserialization code. That is not possible in Rust. And therefore, we need a method to generate code at compile time. And the number one way to do that in Rust is macros. And don't think that this is the C style macros that some of you might already know. I'm, I'm old. I, I, I've, I, I have been doing coding for nearly 30 years now. So I, I learned C and I saw that C macros are not the greatest thing on earth. This is not your grandparents' macros. Macros in Rust are a different beast. They are essentially a meta-programming language. You can implement your own DSLs, domain-specific languages, using macros inside of Rust. In this case, it just serves as a kind of replacement for runtime reflection. Because here, the serializer for this type, the deserializer for this type, the toString method for this type, they are generated at compile time by this macro. So take that away that from, from this talk. That is also a reason why this stuff is fast, because it doesn't do a reflection at runtime. It does everything at compile time. And that's awesome. That's simply awesome. It speeds up your API, your web application, and so on. Now, if we scroll down a little bit, you see some other things. For instance, here you see a data type, which is called option. This would be, um, this would be a data transfer object, which we can use to update the to-do item. And you see this type option here, you see it very often. And that's another very important uh, property of Rust. Rust doesn't have null values. There are no null values in Rust. You cannot say this thing is nullable and then you access it uh, after all and you get a null reference exception. Something like this cannot happen in Rust, at least in safe Rust. If you go down to the metal, you can write unsafe Rust, but this is another topic. We will not go into that uh, rabbit hole today. So for now, you can see we are completely null safe by design. You cannot have null values. If you want to say something is optional, you don't make it nullable. You say this is an option. And then you must write code that handles the case that a value is not present. Rust forces you to do so. Now, there is no way of getting around that. Somehow you have to do that. Now, here we see something else. Here we see another data type. Um, and in this case, this data type has the to-do item embedded. It combines the primary key of the object and the object itself. And you see, again, using macros, we can add additional rules for serialization and deserialization. SIRD stands for serialization and deserialization. It's the name of the framework that you use for JSON serialization for any kind of serialization. In fact, in this case, it's just JSON. Um, and here you can, again, by using macros, tell the system that it should not nest this embedded structure, but it should flatten everything. It should look like as if there would be the ID, the title, the notes, and so on, in a flat way. So you see, this is not very difficult. Yeah, you have to get used to it. You have to get used to that this is a macro, but at the end of the day, it's very similar to what you know from other languages where you use things like, like attributes or, um, uh, or, or things like that, okay? Decorators, however they are called in your favorite language. Okay, what else do we have? Uh, I scroll down a little bit, down a little bit. Okay, here you see that I implemented a to-do store, which is just an in-memory hash map. Some languages call it dictionary, we call it hash map, and then I implemented a bunch of methods. See, this, for instance, get to do's will deliver all the different to do's in our hash map, but it supports pagination. You see that one? So we can say, hey, skip the first three and then give me 10 or something like this. And take a look at this code. I will zoom in a little bit more so you can see it. Here, you see another very powerful aspect of Rust you can use so-called iterators. In other languages, you often call this MapReduce or you call it Link or you call it a Streaming API or whatever. In Rust, you can do these things with iterators. You can say skip and take and other things just to, to do processing of uh, collections. And that's a very powerful abstraction. 
this powerful abstraction, you don't have to pay for it at runtime for uh, with, with slower APIs. That's not the case. These iterators are compiled to the optimum code and in many cases it's just a for loop at the end. Um, but uh, it, the abstraction with which you program as a developer is really, really nice. In this case, I'm taking the values of my hash map, then I say skip to skip over the necessary rows for pagination. And then I say take to only take the number of rows that I would like to have for the current page of the to-do items. So you see, pretty simple to do. Even simpler is getting a to-do item from a hash map by ID. Very simple, very simple thing here. Now, if we want to add things, as you can see it here, we can simply generate a new ID. Here I'm using um, um, a so-called uh, atomic structure. I'm, I'm using an um, atomic uh, integer, uh, I think it was, so I can um, do an atomic operation to add one to the primary key and generate an in-memory primary key. And then I simply add an element to the, to the hash map. That's it. And then we have a remove and we have an update and I don't think that I have to go into very many details here. So this little library here is just a helper library and you typically do that. You put logic and data model in a separate project so you can reuse it for different purposes. You can use it for a REST API, you could use it for a gRPC API, you could even compile it to WebAssembly and use maybe some parts of the logic on the client side in a browser for instance or embed it in a C-sharp application or whatever you want to do. So you uh, typically, if you build web APIs with any kind of framework in Rust, you try to keep your data structures and your business logic and your data access logic decoupled from the protocol layer from the implementation of the web API. I think this is nothing special, right? Still, I wanted to, to point it out here because some people think when they hear Rust, they only think system language. And they think that it, it must feel like C or something like this, and it should be hard, and it has null pointers and pointer arithmetics and things like that. No, that's not the case. If you build an application in Rust, you, th this really feels like a higher level language. It really feels like a managed language to many respects. And that's the, that's the point that I want to make here. Good, so now we assume that we have our DTOs, our data transfer objects, we have our business logic, which is not related to any API so far. And now we move one step up and take a look at the code that we need to write in order to get an API. I will do a code walkthrough today. So you will not see me writing a lot of code, but of course we will try it. We can debug it, things like that um, I'm, I'm going to do, okay? So let's take a look at the API. By the way, if you wonder, hmm, where do I get this code? Can I try this code? Can I have it? Can I play with it? Can I recap um, what, what Reiner just said? Of course, send me a direct message uh, or send me an email. You can Google me. You're pretty sure you will find me on the internet. Just send me a direct message via LinkedIn, for instance, and I'm more than happy to send you a link to the GitHub repo. That's all part of a GitHub repo that I typically use for Rust trainings. So let's take a look at the API. Here, you see the cargo toml file. If you're new to Rust, then this cargo toml file might not be familiar to you. Now, cargo toml is a configuration file where you, on the one hand side, define your metadata. What is the name of the library? What is the version? Who is the author? Copyright, blah, blah, blah. All these things are in. And, and that's very important, you have all your dependencies. So it's kind of package JSON. For the JavaScript developers in the room, it's kind of csproj for the .NET developers in the room, something like this, right? And here you see the dependencies. We are, build, we are building our API based on Axum. This is the API framework built by the Tokyo team sitting in front at the very top of the Tokyo technology stack. And then we have a bunch of lower level libraries, which we just need for certain aspects, but we are really only working, not, not fully, but mostly working with Axum. Here you see Tokyo. This is the IO, the, the async runtime that we need in order to support asynchronous code in Rust. 
Then we have tower, what you see here. Tower is the middleware system. You can build middlewares with that. Middleware for doing authentication, error handling, logging, adding timeouts, adding throttling and all these things. These middleware components are not built in Exum and that's the important thing. Exum is the API for or the web development framework to keep to be more uh, more generic because you could build interactive websites with Exum too, although we are only taking a look at the API part today. But the important thing that you I want you to take away from this talk is that the middleware system with which you can build API middlewares is not part of Exum. It's part of a lower level in the Tokyo stack. So if you build your middlewares with Tower, you can not just use it with Axum, you can use it anywhere in the Tokyo stack where Tower is referenced. You could use it, if you have logging for instance, you could use the logging middleware on the server side for the web server and on the client side for the HTTP client for instance. You could use it for other APIs. You can build your own stuff on top of it. You can build um, you, you, you can build unit tests based on it and you can do a lot of things. It's not part of Axum. It's part of a lower level of the API layer here. What else do we have? We concretely have a middleware here. This is tracing. I will show you the tracing middleware in a second. And what else do we have? Yeah, we have Serdi. This is the serialization and deserialization library. And we are going to use JSON as our serialization protocol. So you see, we mainly focus on the Tokyo stack here and only add a few extra stuff. In this case, Serdi for JSON serialization and our own, finally, our own great to do logic where we reference the project that you have seen below. This was the project with the uh, data structures and, and the data access and things like that. So this is what we what we do here. Uh, once you have installed all these dependencies, you can start coding. Now let's take a look at the source file. The beginning is rather boring. You see a lot of use statements. This just brings certain namespace modules into our code so we can use the types which are referenced here. We can use the modules which are referenced here. It's just like a using an import statement. I think you should know the concept of importing modules or namespaces from other programming languages, I guess. Uh, so let's fold that up because it's not super useful, all these usings. Okay. Now, please ignore this line for a second. We will come back to it later. The important thing where I would like to continue is this one. If you are a developer like I am, you probably are not surprised that there is a main method. And that's the same here in, uh, in Rust. But the important thing is that this is an async main method. And this, this is an important one. Rust, if you build web APIs with Axum and Rust, everything is async. <laughs> I nearly said everything is awesome. It is awesome too, but it's 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 async. It's this is what I wanted to say. Everything is async. It's async main, and the possible and the thing that makes it possible to have an asynchronous main method is Tokyo. Here you see again a macro. We now know what this hashtag means. It means that here we are using a macro that wraps the real main generated by Tokyo around our async main. And then Tokyo manage all the async calls. It does the heavy lifting. It communicates with the underlying operating system. It makes sure that uh, things like um, yeah, primitives of the operating system for asynchronous input output, asynchronous network calls, asynchronous um, disk IO and things like that, that they are handled accordingly. Okay, this is what we what we have here. So um, this is not a web API framework that forces you to build um, synchronous APIs and block threads. This is built for high throughput but still it makes the programming very convenient because everything is async from the top to the bottom. So this is another takeaway here. Next one, let's jump over the tracing subscriber here and let's go into the router. The next code here that you see is pretty self-explanatory. I will walk you through, but I guess everything is pretty clear. 
See, here we are creating a router. We have a server-side router here and we simply say these are my routes. The route is to do's, the route is to do slash and then we have a flexible uh, 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 a variable here in the route and one is called to do slash persist and inside of the routes we can define the HTTP methods that we would like to handle as you can see here get and post and delete and patch and get and post I think you get the point and guess what these things are here these are the handler functions so everything is very functional oriented here you do not like in other frameworks you do not create classes and then you add some attributes or, or, um, or decorators or whatever they are called in your favorite language on top of the classes and then some, some router is doing some reflection magic to find all the classes which have certain base class and nothing like that happens. It's really, it's, everything is wired at compile time and you work in a very function or functional oriented way. You simply define handler functions. If you are a Go developer, this should be very familiar to you. If you are a Node.js, Express.js developer, this should look very familiar to you. If you are a .NET developer and you know about ASP.NET Core minimal API, this should also look very familiar to you. It's not a difficult thing. Now, of course, all these handler functions, they have to share a central state. They have to work on some kind of, for instance, database access layer or in our case, an in-memory collection of stuff. And this is done in Axum using this with state thing. This is the kind of dependency injection that we need in this case. And now we go back to the line above here. We are creating a database which is not really a database. This is exactly the hash map that you have seen before. It's just an in-memory collection of to-do items. I just called it DB. We are newing up a database and then giving this database to the Axum dependency injection system. And every handler function up here can say, oh, I need access to the database, to DB. And if you do that, you will get access to the DB. That's the point here. Okay, so that's a kind of dependency injection if you want. And last but not least, you can add your layers. And these layers are middleware layers. And here, Tower comes in. So you use this, this Tokyo uh, library, which is called Tower, to add layers. And here, now we are also going back to this, where I said, hey, forget it for the moment. I'm setting up a tracing here a kind of logging if you want. I can configure this logging. I've, in this case, I for instance say, hey, if uh, my library, the to-do logic, writes some log statements, please use the log level debug. If tower has something that it wants to log, please use log level debug. So I can configure my logging here. And at the end of the day, I'm adding this tracing layer through a middleware. And this middleware is now where tower comes in. And here you see that 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 Axum is really built on the whole Tokyo stack. It doesn't bring its own middleware concept as many other API framework. It is built on this standardized powerful uh, fundament of, of, of Tokyo. Of course, in real world, you wouldn't put something like that directly hard coded in your code. You would add things like, uh, like .env and things like that. That's all there. So don't worry. Uh, in the last few minutes, I can show you a little bit of a larger sample where all this is done and you can take a look at it in my, in my training material. So let's scroll down and take a look at where the real fun goes on. First, we start the server. That's not very funny. We, we simply say, okay, please listen on localhost, use the port 3000. Again, in a real world app, we will make that flexible, of course. And then we simply say, bind the server to this address and serve the app. The app is the router. So we simply say, hey, router, you have to serve incoming HTTP requests. That's it. And now let's take a look at handler functions because I guess that this is exactly what you would like to see. Uh, I have to make it like that. So I cannot zoom in. I hope you can read everything. If not, please let me know, okay? So let's take a look at a handler function. This handler function is called get to do's. Well, guess what it does? It returns to do's. 
Now we have two interesting, three interesting things, in fact, going on. First one, pagination. See that one? In this case, we use a so-called extractor, which is called query. And I can't think you can guess from the context what query extractor does. It extracts data from the query string. Which data does it ex extract from the query string? The data that you specify. You see, this is part of my to-do logic. This is not directly connected with Axum. This is without Axum. It's simply a data structure where I say there is a query parameter which is called offset. There is a query parameter which is called limit. Both are optional as you can see it here. And later on, we use this pagination. Remember, I showed that to you when doing the get to use where we do the skip and the take. See, this is what we do here. So if we take a look at this one, this is very simple. We simply say, hey, Axum extract stuff from the query parameters out of the incoming API request, out of the incoming HTTP request. Option means that this is again optional. It might be that there are no query parameters. Then I will get none. None is the, the, uh, the value for an option that simply doesn't contain anything. Next one is the dependency injection. It says state DB. This is exactly the type that I showed you before. This is essentially the hash map in our case of the values in real life that would probably be some data access layer. Data access layer means that it, uh, it would be some kind of library uh, through which I can access my Postgres database or my SQL database or my Oracle database or whatever I want. In our case, to keep it simple, it's in memory. And then we can simply code our API. First, what we do, because we are here in memory, we are getting a reader writer lock. This is an RW lock. We are in memory. So therefore we have to make sure that we protect our shared data properly. We get a read lock on the data. In real world databases, you wouldn't do that. You would simply get a database connection. That's fine. And then here we call the underlying logic. We call the logic library and say, do whatever you have to do. This is the pagination data. Get me the to do's. And finally, how difficult is it to return JSON? Not at all. We simply take, in this case, the JSON responder, give it the DTOs that we would like to return. It will respect all the 30 macros, serialization and deserialization commands, convert them into JSON and return that as the response. So it's really just defining the extractors from the query string or from the, from the path and things like that, getting some shared state like dependency injection, perform the logic and return JSON, for instance. Sorry, I have to lower down the blinds here because the sun is coming down. I wasn't expecting so much uh, sun. I will be back in five seconds. So I hope it was really only five seconds, but now it should be better. Okay, good. So we have the get method here. Let's take a look at a method which adds some additional information. I mean, take a look at this one. You have this flexible parameter in the, in the, que uh, sorry, in the path here. How do we extract something from the path? Well, the answer is simple. You use another extractor. Before we had the extractor query and now you're using the extractor path. It is as simple as that. We extract something from the path. With this, we get the ID. We get the shared state again, as you can see it here. We get a read lock because we are handling in-memory data. And then we simply ask the underlying business logic layer, hey, business logic layer, do we have something with this ID? Can you remember this returns something which is called an option? And the option can be either none or some. In the case of some, so something is there. In other languages, you would, you would return a non-null value here. You can do something with the value. In this case, we transfer it into JSON and return it as a response. If we get none, we can say, okay, we want to build a different response. And here you see another very interesting thing in Axum. In Axum, you can use so-called tuples. Uh, you know tuples from other programming languages, I guess. You can simply create a tuple out of a status code 
and some data. Uh, there, there are other possibilities too um, and if we would have more time if this would be a training I could go into very much details showing you how to work with that but uh, from uh, for, for this talk I just want to show you how flexible you are in one, um, uh, one branch of your if statement you can return JSON in the other you can return a status code in the next you can return whatever you want I think you got the idea so far if not please let me know now the rest here is pretty much the same. The only thing where, where I have to um, add some additional information for you is this one. Because so far we extracted data from the path, we extracted data from the query string and now we have to extract data from the body. Of course we are interested in data from the HTTP request body. And this is done with another extractor which is called JSON. Of course it is called JSON. It will deserialize the body and give me an instance of to-do item. This um, extractor will of course handle errors. Uh, there, there is some, some validation going on and you can even write your own extractors if you want, if you have very specific business logic. But this is, this is um, making sure that there is a valid to-do item coming in. And then again, in this case, write lock add the data through the business logic and return status code created with a certain JSON. Again, with a tuple. See that one? Ah, I have to mention something. Uh, for those of you who are not that deep into Rust, you might wonder why we don't have, uh, let me see, how can I write it here? Um, why we don't have a return something and then a semicolon here at the end you might answer that you might question that why why this this is missing well uh, this is a shortcut in rust a shortcut that means that i can leave out the semicolon at the end if it's the last thing in the method and the return statement and therefore the last element in this method is an expression and that will automatically be the return value this is how you write Rust. So if you are new to Rust, you are missing the return statement. Oh, I'm very sorry. You have to give up on, on return. No, of course there is a return statement, but it isn't, it isn't typical to use the return statement if you can avoid it. Okay, nice. Now the rest is just additional stuff which brings nothing new to the table. So far you have seen that it is not very difficult. Let's quickly add a, a recap, the most important things, and then we will spend the last five minutes taking a look at a, a little bit of a larger sample. I can't do a complete walkthrough there, but I would like to point out some very important things. Ah, before we do that, I didn't start it, right? I didn't start it. So I would like to say, uh, just run Axum, okay? This compiles everything as you see and I have prepared some requests just to make sure that you really believe me and that this really works. So give the system a second for the first time when you compile something for the first time and I, I really removed everything from this, uh, from this application, just the source code is there. So now we are running. Uh, if you compile it for the first time, Rust takes a while, then it's getting faster. And you see, currently our to-do list is empty. If I add something, we get a proper return, we get a proper HTTP response code, and I can query it, and now I have something here, and I can page it, and, and things like that. And I have offset one, so therefore I don't get anything back. I think you get the idea, right? So I proved it, it works. And here, down here, you see the logs. These are the logs from Tower that I talked about. Good, so let's now summarize. Um, we have Axum, which is part of the Tokyo technology stack. It's built on top of other Tokyo layers, like for instance, Tower and Hyper and Mio and whatever. We can build a pow use a powerful router which supports paths, path parameters, different HTTP methods, very functional oriented. We can have state, shared state kind of dependency injection, and we can have middleware layers built on top of, um, uh, of tower. And then we have so-called extractors like query and path and JSON, which, re uh, which extract things from the incoming request. And we have responders like JSON or just a status code and things like that so that we can build an HTTP response. Last thing, always, as usual in other programming languages too, 
separate your logic and data structure from your API implementation through different projects, as you can see it here. Now, this is what I wanted to show you in this simple, simple sample. And now let's take a look at a more elaborate sample. And I would like to point out some, uh, some typical things. First, you see that we don't have to write everything in a single file in Rust. Of course not. You can structure your code into modules and there is a clear module boundary where you can say what you would like to share with the outside world. You can say what, you sh what should be private inside of the module. So all these things are there, obviously. Now, if we take a look at uh, some things here, in this case, I am using um, a, a database connection. So don't worry, uh, Rust has a very powerful and vivid ecosystem of open source libraries and, and commercial libraries. In this case, I'm using a connection pool to connect to a Postgres database, as you can see it here. You also have the possibility to use so-called traits. Traits are like interfaces. For what would you do? You, would you use traits beside the system traits that you must use? But for what would you specifically use traits in the context of a web API? Well, typically um, to isolate your web API implementation layer from your, for instance, data access layer. So what I did here is I created a trait which isolates the data access layer. So cleanup technically is a delete from the database. Get by name is a select from the database. Insert is an insert into the database. But I, 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 I built an abstraction here, a trait. And if you take a look at the hero's implementation, it's going to use exactly that trait. If you are new to Rust and you wonder what this DUN stuff is and ARC stuff is and SEND and SYNC stuff is, I'm very sorry, I only have 45 minutes. So ignore that for now. If you are an experienced Rust developer, that should be familiar to you. If not, yes, you have to learn the language and the basics, um, but I can't tell you that in 45 minutes. I would really like to focus on the API part. So what I did here is I created a trait abstraction, like an interface in other languages. Then if you take a look at the uh, here, if you take a look at the implementation of an API handler method, I'm using the trait, not the implementation. Why do I do that? Well, the answer is simple, mocking. If I want to do unit tests, I can scroll down here a little bit. That's very simple because you have, of course, mocking frameworks and the possibility to mock certain things. So you see here, I'm using a mock version of my database access layer. And here I'm setting up a mock function telling the system, hey, if somebody calls the cleanup method, don't go to a database and execute a delete statement, just return uh, nothing, a result. In this case, it's just uh, using a data-driven test. So the test values are up there in the, uh, in, the, in the macros again, okay? Oops, sorry, I scrolled up again. I'm very sorry. Now you see it again. So now I have my repository mock, which is just a mock for the data access layer. And then I can use all my API implementation and I can provide where I need to the mocked repository. So all these things that you are used to from other languages, like mocking certain layers in your application to do proper, um, proper unit tests, or, um, or, or even if you, don't know, if you don't want to, you can also build integration tests. They're all there. They are there. The, the names in Rust are a little bit different. It's traits instead of interfaces. You don't have classes, but you have structs. Of course, you have things like dynamic method dispatching and polymorphism, but it works a little bit different from other object oriented languages, but it is possible. And once you got used to it, it's very powerful. Same is true for error handling. You have powerful concepts of expressing rich errors. You can create errors and let me show you that as the last thing in my sample. Let me scroll down a little bit. Uh, sorry, here, I want it to be here. And this is the stand. Da, 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 da. Where do we want to show it to you? Yes. Yeah, this is exactly what I wanted to show you. Please note, 
this tiny, teeny little uh, character here, this question mark character, this question mark character, it's a real hero. That's a real, real hero in Rust. You know what this question mark does? It says, if there was an error here in the insert statement, which insert something in the database, simply return this error. This says, if error, return the error. Otherwise, move on. That's powerful, this question mark statement. Have you ever done Go development? The typical Go code is always, if do something has an error, error handling, then you go on. So your code is always if, 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 and after each if, you have the error handling, error handling, error handling, error handling. I love Go, but this is not an aspect of Go that I love very much. The question mark removes that burden. And that is really, really nice. You have to understand that Rust doesn't have exceptions. Just like Go, Rust doesn't have exceptions. Because exceptions slow down the performance and you don't have um, a clear idea when what is going to happen. So there are no exceptions. But the question mark operator the, uh, it, it is really a powerful thing here. So error handling works like a charm in Rust. Okay, so you see it's possible to build larger APIs and this is exactly what I wanted to show you today. I only had 45 minutes and my goal was to, sh to give you a rough overview about how it feels to build APIs with Axum and Rust. To quickly summarize, Rust is fast, it's secure, it's a very modern language, but it doesn't come out of the box with a framework to build APIs. If you want to build an API, you have to decide for a framework. You don't want to build it from scratch. That's a huge difference to Go, for instance. There are a lot of frameworks out there. Today, we covered only one. We covered the Axum framework, which I particularly like because it's built on the Tokyo stack, which is so widespread in the Rust ecosystem. So therefore, if you ask me, Axum is a great choice when you build your APIs in Rust. I only had 45 minutes. I hoped you enjoyed this last session of the day. Unfortunately, I couldn't be with you in London, but still, I'm still here. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask the nice moderator in the room. Uh, she can probably relay your questions to me. You can also, if you work, if you watch from home, you can also ask your questions through the chat. I'm more than happy to answer these questions. My name is Rainer Stropek, and if you have any questions, feel free to link yourself through LinkedIn, Twitter, or whatever. You sure you will find me on the internet, and then we can have a chat via direct message or emails or whatever you choose in order to. Uh, make, you, make you successful with Rust and Exum. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to me.